Welcome to Flesh and Pod, a flesh and blood podcast, breaking down weekly news and notes from the tournament scene, community drama, game strategy, and more. And now, here are your hosts, Derek and Logan. Hello, and welcome to episode 92 of Flesh and Pod. My name is Logan. I am your host. And with me, as always, is the technolo- the technologically challenged. I am not technologically challenged. I just have technology-related challenges in my life. I know how to fix it. It's just getting there and or having the resources. <laughs> resources and time. Those are actually... Uh, I could write a memoir and title it resources and time. And that would be the perfect summation of everything wrong with my life. Do right. I have enough resources or do I oh, have do enough I have time? time? <laughs> so we're going to go with the techno literate, uh, Derek Oswald charmer. What, if anything, did you get up to in flesh and blood this week? Oh, flesh and blood this week. Uh, not a lot unfortunately uh originally the plan was that i so originally the plan was that i was going to uh return to streaming right i was going to mm-hmm. stream starfield and then i was also going to start streaming some Telshare games because that's something i've been looking forward to and unfortunately due to some hiccups i had to delay my return to streaming um i i did live stream friday night uh it was starfield i had a lot of fun and if you're one of the folks who stopped by (laughs) greg uh, i appreciate you (laughs) thank you um but that also means that i didn't hit the like talishar portion yet and then uh for those who don't know the reason that logan led off with this is because uh we're also recording this a little bit late because i when I was streaming Starfield, uh, I kept having these hitches and it was very noticeable and it was frustrating me. And it turns out uh, that game cannot be played on anything other than an SSD. And I, um, I was just, I, I'm just poor. Admit I don't, I just don't, admit to it. Just don't, I don't have, listen, I don't have like a newer rig. Didn't have a lot of drive space. And so uh, I was trying to play Starfield on a SATA drive. Uh, turns out not, not okay. Um, so I, I've rectified that problem. I got myself a new, like two terabyte SSD, but I was in the process of moving a bunch of stuff over and that broke a bunch of installation pathways, which meant my camera wasn't working and so on and so forth. So anyway, uh, didn't get to a lot of flesh and blood stuff because I've been trying to solve some technology problems, but we are hoping to kick things back this week. Uh, It's sounding like, uh, Wampa might record on Thursday this week. So I might try to make an armory or at least half an armory. The problem is I'm also going to be uh, recording another show Wednesday night. That is the problem. Wednesdays are always the worst <laughs> night for me. And that's the only time my armories are. Uh, I will, no matter what, though, uh, there is a really cool sealed event that my locals have coming up. And I do plan on participating in that. It's going to be Monarch sealed. But instead of six packs of Monarch, uh, we are going to throw in some Dust Till Dawn packs for the building as well. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be on the weekend. So this next week upcoming, um, I'll, I'll have more flesh and blood stuff to cover. But this week, unfortunately, uh, I will also say, though, um, got to catch up on coverage that I missed because I had no power. And uh, it was good stuff. There were some really quality games at the Nationals this yeah, year. Absolutely. I, I was good. I raved about coverage last week and rightfully so. It was well done. Games were good. Uh, some of the games were were actual great. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I couldn't recommend enough uh, going back and watching that coverage. It's phenomenal. I've gone back and watched uh, some of the stuff that I'd already seen over again, just because I was like, okay, this is this is great. So I was, uh, what the hell does that do? Okay, we're also recording in a new app right now, and. If you hear me just kind of hit a what the fuck moment, it's because there's something in this app that I didn't know I was trying to do. So right now the app is trying to tell me that Charmer's out of focus, but like to me, he always looks blurry. So um, I think that he uh, shifts between two different realities at all times. That's kind of my thought process on that one. Don't do that. Just don't do that. Like, why do you got to be like that? That's... It's what I do. That's unhelpful. 
it's very yeah. unhelpful. Okay. Well, I was just you know. checking. I was making sure that I'm not actually out of focus. You're not. You're good. I'm just um, not focused on the task at hand. And so okay. the app the app was like, hey, 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 focus, Charmer, focus. It knew that mentally I was not thinking about Flesh and Pod just now. Mentally, I was thinking to myself, oh, man, look at this shiny face. It's not that shiny. And, it could be well, shiny. It, I'm gonna, but, it, but like, there's, a, there's some spots. And so then I was remembering a conversation I had with Doa about how he uses a, a cream instead of powder. And then I was like, oh, man, I was going to ask him for that. And then, like, so the, the app knew that this is my brain. It was just derailing. It was like, hey, tell Charmer to focus. The, and then <laughs> the app is already Charmer aligned. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, this thing's great. Fuck, we should have been using this forever ago. Yeah, we're about 20 minutes away from the app reporting us to the FBI, however. <laughs> Probably true. That's fine. Wouldn't be the first time. The uh, Yeah, it's, I, I actually got to play Armory on Thursday night. We drafted our WTR, and so that's always fun. I love drafting WTR. It's still one of my favorite drafts to do. Uh, one of the locals had some Belgian boxes, which are always fun because the cards are a little bit different. They feel different. Uh, and uh, I ended up opening a Belgian foil tech plating, which is like, great because that will go into my collection the one i'm the ones i have i'm pretty sure are all japanese or i think they're all japanese um printing of wtr so it's nice to get a little ver variety in there um i was i was actually playing bravo so i got to play tech plating um that was fun i can tell though that i'm very very rusty just in flesh and blood in general because i was just making some bad decisions uh then su saturday we had the Rhodey uh, Sack Pack Spectacular, which is just our, it's pack battles with twists and turns and Tom Fuckery. Um, I did end up playing one of my, a, a pretty, a couple of pretty good, like, well-focused games, but eventually, as soon as I had a loss in that, means I wasn't going to be able to take the belt off of uh, He Who Should Not Be Named. And so, because I wasn't going to be able to take the belt off of him, I just kind of lost my focus. And was like, yeah, fuck it, don't care, whatever. And I probably need to get past that with Pro Quest season coming up and just always be, like, trained in, focusing. I also got, like, some reading material. So, like, Alpha Clash sent me this book. So I'm just reading this book, too. Uh, Derek, you got one of these, didn't you? I did. I yeah. didn't even know it was coming. It was a very pleasant surprise. They sent me a book um, and one of the VIP Coggins. Yeah. And I did not own one before, so. I know we've said it before, but the people at Alpha Clash are great. Just love them. They're awesome to us. So, uh, shout out to them. I still, I'm going to read this whole thing. It's like a 500 page book. Like, it's going to, it's going to take a bite out of some time. With, I, anybody that knows me already knows that time is, time is in short supply. <laughs> a lot time of the time. Time and resources. <laughs> I'm, I'm much. <laughs> I'm much shorter on one than the other, <laughs> but, uh -huh. um, yeah. So, uh, battle hard in Columbus happened this weekend. Neither of us were there. Yeah, that was, uh, that was unfortunate. I was originally planning on trying to come down because flake was going to be same reason present, I was yep. right. Um, uh, we had a, a wonderful weekend planned and then it was just one calamity after another so flake had car trouble he was unable to make it uh, my wife was doing some stuff with uh friends and so i had um both of my boys and i even did contemplate at one point i was like maybe i could just you know drive down like they like card games and they can hang out and but i, I didn't want to try to like play competitive flesh and blood while also having to answer the questions of two adhd children so um, I ended up uh, passing on that one, but I do fully am, intend here in the next couple of weeks to really hit the testing hard. And that was the big reason I wanted to go to this event was because I just want to shake reps. the rust off. Yep, yeah, get the reps in uh, before Pro Quest season coming. So, yeah, the um, there's a lot of calamities about Battle Hard and Columbus coverage didn't wind up not happening because. Uh, Ethan Van Sant fell sick and didn't make it. Uh, Flake had car trouble and didn't make it. Uh, but through all this, you know, some things never change. And Brody Spurlock won Battle Hard in Columbus playing Lexi. So, yeah, you know, at least some things hit the status quo. Uh, 
And then because, you know, we're just discussing the status quo here, Michael Fang won the PTI event, also playing Lexi. And both of those players were in both top eights. So as you can imagine, eh, okay, you know, some things never change. But uh, that was a shock to no one to see those two sitting at the top tables doing the work uh, and getting in there. Uh, congrats to both of them. Uh, I don't know how much there is to say about about those events now where pretty soon we're going to have a fresh look at things. Um, so it gets a little harder to sort of focus in on, on these events to, for me. I do think that we're, I mean, it's pretty obvious. I mean, I mean, obvious is the wrong word. There's some amount of clarity in that Lexi is the best deck currently. And that's why players of Brody and, and Michael Feng's caliber are playing it. Yeah. So this this has created I almost took to uh, like Twitter today about this because this is creating uh, a bit of an identity crisis with me ahead of ProQuest season because I really want to give this one a, a good solid go. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll never, I think, have the free time to be like a truly 100% competitive flesh and blood player the way that I would like to. Uh, but every now and then I, I like to set goals for myself and just remind myself what I'm capable of. And I, that's kind of what I want to do for this ProQuest season. Um, but I'm like a, a pretty devout Bravo and Uzuri player right like those are my two heroes that i enjoy the most um considering myself pretty loyal and I'm, I'm having trouble because uh this game really does a wonderful job of making you fall in love with a character and then if you have any sort of like competitive side too you know it's like man i really want to play these on bravo or uziri but also i i really do feel like you know lexi is probably the best chance to win an event um, and then even off of Lexi, not to, again, not to say that I couldn't do well with Bravo and Ozuri. I think they're actually pretty decent choices in the current meta, but, um, even after those two, I don't even think that either one of them are the next best. I think Icelander is probably the next best. And then those two fall into like that third part of the triangle. And so like, I, I don't know, cause I keep going back and forth on the, I want to do well, but I also, I kind of want to do it on my own terms with the heroes I love. You know? So that's kind of funny because I it's it reminds me a bit of the Starvo meta where the if Oldham was very good in the Starvo meta, but you had to play Oldham perfectly in the Starvo meta. However, if you were somebody that could pilot Oldham uh, efficiently and and make good decisions with Oldham which was very difficult to do in into the decks that existed prism and bravo or starvo uh if you but if you could uh you had a good matchup into you had a, a at least a, a winnable matchup into virtually everything and it kind of reminds me of icelander right now where icelander has icelander is very good but you better be ready to pilot it damn near perfect otherwise you're going to make one critical error that probably would have won you the game um, three turns later, and instead you gave your opponent an extra turn, and that extra turn is all they needed to get there. So it's hard right now. Um, but yeah, I, I think that we are in a world where, yes, Lexi's the best deck. I know I see, and this is kind of gets to me too. And we're a show that talks about gr what grinds our gears all the fucking time. So why stop now? People keep complaining about Lexi, but don't they know that there's always a best deck in the format? There there never isn't. There's always something well, that is the top of the mountain. So this, this is an interesting point, right? Technically, you're correct. At any given time, there is always a best deck. The, the best kind of correct. Right. Technically, Technically correct, correct is the best kind of correct. The problem is, is that just because an optimal choice exists doesn't mean that people know about it. And it also sure. doesn't mean that people are capable of piloting it and that, how do I want to put this? There is, especially after like new launches or after, you know, ban and suspended announcements and things like that, um, kind of like this weird honeymoon phase of playtesting again, right? Where 
yeah, something probably exists, and you might even have a good idea of what it might be, but that uncertainty, I think, makes people feel like they have more agency. And so I think that's the part that they fall in love with. And then when they feel like they have less agency, whether it's true or not, in a vacuum, it, it's about that feeling, right? Sure. The complaints are always feeling based. And so, yeah, Lexi is the best deck. And Lexi has been, you know, arguably the best deck since Outsiders came out. Um, but like when you think about early outsiders when people were still trying to figure it out versus now there was a lot less complaints and it doesn't mean that empirically anything is different it's just that it felt more open at the time right yeah, yeah i mean I think that's true uh, if you needed any evidence of lexi's uh, current dominance uh, we can just look at the living legend points uh Courtesy of Vishra, again, thank you very much for compiling these results. That's awesome of you. It gives us some pretty easy talking points. Lexi has 380 LL points during that season. And if you take, even if you take out the 130 that uh, Lexi's gotten off of events that weren't national qualifiers, or that weren't, not national qualifiers, uh, that weren't national events, that's still 250 and well ahead of anybody else. The next closest hero is actually Briar. But uh, Dromai has 92. And um, so that's not even close. Yeah. Um, right now, Lexi is sitting just shy of 800, looking at 792. I, there's not enough points out there, I don't think, really re to realistically get her over the top. But everything, and you know, anything is possible. There are enough, you know, physical points to do it. But it would, she would need to win a giant um, share. So I don't know. She's gonna be around, it seems like, and probably, but probably not for very long. Pro Quest season is probably gonna kill off Lexi. And that's fine. Probably kill off Icelander too. But we said that about Briar, and eh, that didn't happen. So uh, not until Nationals. But uh, Icelander sitting at 816. Uh, did not pick up a ton of points this past week, but picked up a couple. I uh, And like I guess nobody else is really, no other heroes within um, any sort of danger of LLing. Those are really the two we're keeping our eye on. What So... We're, I mean, our next season for anything is ProQuest season before Worlds. And we don't anticipate that the results from ProQuest season will apply to Worlds for Living Legend purposes. But we don't actually know that. So if you were, if you were somebody that knew, was playing Worlds, would you be preparing now with Lexi and Icelander in mind? Or would you be looking elsewhere? I think I would still be preparing with Icelander and Lexi in mind. Personally, um, like I said, I, I just, I don't anticipate, even though we don't know, I don't anticipate them throwing you that curveball at the end of ProQuest season and giving you such a short time to alter. But also, if I'm being honest, um, assuming that one or because the other scenario is like one or both might go but there's also the chance that they don't make it so you would still want to have that prep in right things could just pull another briar and you know they could be at 998 one could make it but you know like let's say lexi goes over the top but icelander doesn't so i i think that you're doing yourself a disservice to do any sort of prep without them in the pool um even with the uncertainty about whether or not the process or pro quest season will count. Sorry, my brain is going faster than my mouth. Um, I just feel like there's still the chance that they could be there. And if we still think that they are one of the best decks, even if they slow down or have like a, a slower season, you still want to be prepared for them. Uh, the other thing, if I'm being honest, is like, let's just say hypothetically those two are gone, right? Is there any deck that you feel would be so wildly untested already that you couldn't transition to 
that suddenly looks good. And the reason I mention this is because and maybe if you're a newer player, sure, but um, when you're looking at the other decks that are doing well now, right? Uh, Bravo, Uzuri, Dromai, uh, Dash, these are all heroes that have been around for a while. A lot of people have reps on them, uh, even going as far as like Fi or Katsu. Um, you know, there was a time when Fi was the, the top dog in the meta and a lot of people have reps on that list. And so will you be a little rusty? Sure. But like at the end of the day, if at the last minute you have to switch over to that, um, what happens, is, and this is ultimately the reason why, right? What happens in that scenario is that if you do your preparation with the intention of uh, Lexi and Icelander still being available, and then suddenly they're not, the number of players who probably are preparing solely for them both to be gone is so small that you're not going to have that much of an edge over anyone else. You're going to be in the same basket. So like, that's sure. the other reason why. I think you do yourself a, a disservice if you don't prepare for them. And then on the off chance that they are gone, I don't think that many other people will take the other side of that coin flip and be that far ahead of you. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. Uh, I would... I would definitely be approaching this as if they're going to be around regardless. Um, that's just my two cents. I might have a backup plan of right now, like what is Lexi or what are Lexi and Iceland are keeping down? Well, Fi is a good example. Like Fi is sort of hard to play into decks that can tax you. They can just shut yeah. you off. You don't have belittle to help smooth things out by getting a blue minnowism to give you enough resources to be operable still. That's just not a part of the game plan any longer. So because of that specifically, uh, that's that's maybe like what I keep in my back pocket. But if I was thinking, okay, I want to play a deck that is going to give me the best chance to win, I would be looking at those two, and then and then potentially, okay, what can what can have a good game into those? Looking at Dromai, looking at um. No, that's about it, really. Dromai and Azuri, maybe? And although Azuri is hard into Lexi, right? If I remember right. No, it's the other way. Is Uzuri it the way is, around? Okay. Yeah, Uzuri, it, at least the mid-range one, is one of the right. few decks that seems to do well against Lexi right now. Okay, so like maybe that'd be like in my plan. You know, just I'll have this ready to go so that if there is... Yeah. If I feel like this would be a better choice, you know, we can be there. I know a lot of people are going to put in a ton of reps on a bunch of different decks, you know, from the onset. They do have bright lights to consider in their testing, too. Maybe it does push dash. Yeah, and yeah maybe... it's funny you mentioned, because I was just about to say, for me, uh, I think that my backup plan, if you will, is dash. Just because I expect some decent amount of sauce and that's a deck that you're also very familiar with, but it's also a deck that is capable, just like Fi, of putting out a lot right. of firepower if it's not taxed, so. Or playing a controlling game plan where it's just blocking and shooting, and that's really yeah, yeah. all it's doing. Don't, don't, give me, uh, don't give me nightmares, man. <laughs> oh yeah, Guardian player, shit, sorry. Yeah. Forgot to, forgot to put a trigger warning on that Defense one. Defense.deck is not my friend uh when it's the dash version no absolutely not uh, that's when you're playing you're it's like okay play reinar arc smash like go break stuff but yep and uh still not on the board azalea new prism Leviah, arachne katsu phi and vincent those are for still, the season for the season you. Yes, they have not achieved any living legend points during this Nationals season. Moving on, uh, we did get the information for the Talarian Community College uh, crossover with Flesh and Blood uh, called Round the Table. It's coming out on September 29th as an MSRP of effectively $70. Uh, it's 10 mm -hmm. cents away, I guess. I'm not going to hem and haw on that. Uh, you do have... 100 new cards, 100 plus new cards in the set. Uh, all of them are classic constructed legal, which we may have opinions on. Uh, there are four ready to play blitz decks in the box. You have Professor Teklovasen, the mechanologist, which is actually a, the artwork is the professor from the Tolarian Community College. Uh, Melody Singalong, which is your bard. 
Bravant Civic Protector, the Guardian, and then also Ira and the standard everyday Ira. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know your answer to this, and it's only because you're a Guardian player that you're happy that these cards are in classic constructed because you'll no longer be shoeless Joe, the guardian. So, well, it's funny, right? Because I will probably at least test the new boots, but I do think they did a good job of making you second guess because giving up that quicken token is kind of a big deal, right? Or so if you're it? not familiar, there's, there's some new guardian boots. Uh, the two armor and temper, but when you defend with it, you have to give any other player. So obviously in a multiplayer format, you can just say, okay, the person who doesn't care about the Quicken token is who I'll give it to, right? But in classic constructed heads up play, you're obviously stuck giving it to your opponent and that has the potential to, you know, be kind of rough. Now, of course I say it has the potential. Uh, as you said, it might not be a huge deal because you could, for example... Um, use the boots to block in place of a, a card from hand allowing you to set up your dominated spinal crush and then the quicken token means nothing right like there's ways that you can mitigate the impact of it um, mm -hmm. they're certainly the best boots for a guardian uh, that I've seen in a long time ever um, ever I don't know about ever what was better there have been some metas where mage master's boots have actually been really solid Sure, but better. Yeah, I, I, you know, going all the way back then, right? Like if I'm talking like early Welcome to Wrath, Arcane Rising meta, I think I would rather still run Mage Master's boots to play my Findalls and get go again than I would give a, a Katsu or a Chain a free Quicken token. Okay. You know, or a Viserai or whatever. Like I, I think just thinking about those early yeah where they were going very very wide and they had to sometimes jump through some jump something jump through some hoops to make it work yeah yeah i mean if you make it so they don't have as many hoops that's not great but understandable but still i think they're pretty they're pretty good i i do i mean i've already heard the the public on this a little bit frustrated they you know, everybody's hoping that there's not another glistening steel blade situation where there's one or maybe two cards in the seventy dollar set that are a must have for classic constructed and people feel forced into buying it and maybe buying it in multiples. That's that's not the purpose of this though. The purpose of this is is it to be a UPF product. Like it's designed specifically for, for ultimate pit fight. And to buy it with and sit down with friends, uh, three friends, and just bash decks into each other. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I have a very weird. I have a very weird time with this because they easily could have just said no, it's not legal and classic constructed. But then, because of the way the game is, it's there are very few cards that aren't legal and then there you'd have to have a way to really differentiate them. That's obvious. And otherwise, you know, a player might not know and they just be like, okay, cool. So especially at like an armory level or whatever. So I get making them, um, letting them just be CC legal, but I also understand the other side of it where people like, I don't want to feel forced into buying this product. I mean, you're never forced to buy anything, right? Yeah. It's a luxury product. I mean, I, I have a, couple of thoughts in that vein so the first thought is if you're lss and you know people are buying this product for a small handful of cards but now they've got this sweet multiplayer product in their hands then maybe you as the player are incentivized to give the multiplayer format a chance so uh if anything like yeah it sucks but also hey try out this thing and maybe you'll actually have fun with it. Uh, so that that's thought number one, just throwing that out there. Uh, we keep saying how like we want to onboard new players and then here's a product that does it and you also like might get cards that help out your, your CC deck. Uh, thought number two is exactly that, right? So like, let's say this is meant to like help onboard your friends. Well, then like you all go in and you split it. Like, yeah, it's 70 bucks, but like 
if I know that I want the guardian stuff anyway, then like I'll split this, you know, either down the middle with somebody and now it's 35 bucks or four ways. And then it's incredibly reasonably priced. And then we all get decks, but also whoever the new player is, has something potentially good to get them into the game. Uh, but my, my last thought uh, is also just that LSS really hasn't shown a reluctance to reprint stuff really outside of the fables. Um, so if there is a, a, a steel blade, we might see it in the next supplemental set. Like I'm fully under the belief that we're going to get steel blade reprinted in a set in the future. Like I, I just expect it. I would be absolutely shocked if we never got it. Um, so I'm really not that worried about it. It's only a short term problem, right? Like it is a strictly speaking kind of like a, a first world I need it right now to play my competitive deck and I only play heroes that like if you're a diehard Dorinthia player and you didn't want to buy the classic battles but you also wanted to be a competitive player like I get it I understand your play I'm not being unempathetic I'm also just saying that no offense but you're like a very tiny portion of the player base at that point and it's the same thing here right um, the guardians who might want to buy this just for the boots, they can either wait and pick them up as singles when people buy these to, you know, sell the parts, um, or you can wait till they're reprinted or you can go have these with somebody or whatever, you'll figure it out. Yeah. And I think that that's valid. If nothing else, the, you do have, you do have that ability if there is, you know, some specific wants from people or if it's somebody's like hey i thought about buying this and you could just say hey uh, let me split the cost with you here are the only cards i really want out of here and the rest you can just keep and do whatever um i think that's a good solution for people if you can find somebody that is in that boat right uh, that's right. kind of the hard part but you're right i mean i think that in the long term the the pot you know the one yes they reprint things all the damn time i mean it is constant that we're getting older car you know, cards from the first few sets or whatever printed out, and plus history packs, right? Um, that's nothing new. So if they do have something here and there's a price issue, I mean, look at the expansion slot, even though we don't know what it is in Bright Lights, we know that like Tunic is in the expansion slot because Tunic is still, you know, something of a barrier of entry. We'll never see foil tunics again. That's fine. Like that is not a barrier of entry to play. That is a collecting thing. And those are not the same. So here, as long as we're not arguing over cold foil pieces of equipment, because the typical policy is once something's done in cold foil, it's not done again in cold foil. That could cause problems in the collecting sphere because people start buying the product and it doesn't get into the hands of the people you actually want it to go to. But overall, I'm, I'm not mad at this. I think that this is quite a good thing. I I think that the mix of Mech, uh, Ninja, Guardian, plus Bard is very interesting as far as your your hero mix goes. Uh, the Bard stuff actually looks quite fun, um, especially in multiplayer. So I think that there's going to be a lot of... A lot of people kind of getting into that multiplayer UPF vibe when they, when they start on. And, you know, that's the thing is that uh, and I think James White actually said this on Instant Speed. Um, Flesh and Blood's problem, they have the best, and he, he made sure he made a point of this numerous times, that in his mind, he, they have the best international organized play system of any card game out there. I tend to agree. I think on an international stage, they are currently the best. But they are they do struggle in the casual sphere. And that is a very important part of all this. If you don't have enough share of the cap of the casual market, it's very difficult to grow. And that's also the best way to grow new players for the competitive sphere, oddly enough. So right now, I think what they're doing makes sense. And I like this product quite a bit. I still wish it was PVE product, but we know that's that that's next year at the earliest. Technically, until we hear otherwise, every product is PVE product. What's the environment? 
well we don't we don't know but that doesn't mean that we can't use it as the player like that's my point right like we don't know what it is but until we hear that certain cards are not playable in the pve format i assume every card that's printed helps support it sure we just don't know it's like you know it's like every card is a, a upf card until it's not until it's not r.i.p go bananas uh i do want one more thing added uh to this broadcast before we move on from this topic though uh which is in the show notes um for the listeners because you don't have the opportunity to see this i, I need you to understand he wrote this as a uh, professor and then a a capital x meaning for the crossover uh flesh and blood around the table right like that was what he uh put in the show notes and i read this as professor x flesh and blood and before i even finished my brain went wait we get professor x and you flesh know. and blood and i got so excited for a moment and then i was let down so i live to let you down i just i know that out there uh also they're uh they're sending out social play kits to stores that order the uh crossover product so that's also interesting uh they'll have their own special promos they're evergreen so they won't change uh, though, but they may like continue to print these on to demand as they go. So I think that's a good, again, another good step. Um, encouraging social play and enc encourage, encouraging casual play is super important to the growth of flesh and blood. And I honestly feel like they're taking good steps to make sure that the, that, that happens. That's all. Uh, we're supposed to be getting in the near future a little bit more uh detail on those kits and what is in them uh to this point we actually just know that these social play kits are basically not but they're, they're going to be different than armory kits and they can have a wide variety of promos but uh yeah they'll be in the retailer news in a few weeks so we'll see them soon moving on i uh, our buddy our pal our compatriot, the author of the Stoic, Matt DeMarco, otherwise known as Flake, uh, actually had James White on for an interview on Instant Speed this past week. Uh, great interview. Go watch it. It's not just because I'm a Flake stan, although I am. Uh, but it is a great interview. I think this is some of Matt's best work as an interviewer, to be honest. Uh, he was... There was... He asked real questions. And not to say that he doesn't, but this was where something where he definitely was was trying to get answers for a lot of things that are concerns to the community, and it didn't go unnoticed. Great job. Uh, love the content. But one of the most interesting little nuggets of information to come out of that conversation was the announcement of the Living Legend format. Now, Living Legend is quite possibly the best thing ever. Just going to go ahead and throw that out there. Because... All heroes are legal, not just the ones that, that have LL'd. Mm -hmm. There is no banned list. So you want to play Duskblade Chain? Go for it. All day long. Uh, you want as tuned Starvo as you can get? Go nuts. Feel free. You want Cheerios Briar? I don't think it's good when it doesn't make multiple embodiments, but, you know, have at it. Uh, you, I mean, whatever you want, but you want to take Kano completely See, free to the world. Also, it's so, a thing. so funny because there's obviously a lot of emphasis on like Cheerios Briar, but I think what's honestly going to it's be interesting on whether Hammer's Chain is what it, or Fi is what it is. That's actually not what I was interested in. I am interested in if somebody is going to try to crack the puzzle now that there's new tools that is Ball Lightning Lexi. Oh, yeah. Like, Lightning Lexi is back. Yeah. Because Lexi's already got quite a bit of firepower. Um, Ball Lightning turns out hell of a card. And so I'm, I'm curious to see if that makes the rounds. And the reason that that one popped up is because you can still get around uh, Warmongers. Because... Yeah. One of the things that I immediately got excited for was, of course, Duskblade Chain. But now that Warmongers is running around, it's like, oh, well, that's just going to peel off all of your counters on your Duskblade, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that was not something that existed before. Um, so 
Well, basically it was that or Starvo, just because I'm a Bravo stan, and so. Yeah, I thought about a lot of things. Uh, Stubby Hammer's uh, Phi was definitely on my list. That is obnoxious, or sounds obnoxious on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, Starvo, because I played a ton of it. I, I know I know the deck fairly well. Uh, Chain was also, you know, obviously Dustblade is a hell of a drug, and playing Dustblade Chain is a real thing. The other one was uh, Bloodshe Skeleta Viscerai. Going back to the old OTK Viscerai builds, but being able to play things like Warmonger's Recital, when all you're doing is making rune chants on some of your on most of your turns, to to you know neuter some decks, you're not attacking. You don't give a shit. You're waiting to Sonata for 1.6 billion. Yeah. I just feel like that one would be eaten up by the Fies that... Because that's the interesting thing, right. right? Is like, Fi doesn't give a shit about Warmongers. Nope, doesn't care at all. Only plays attacks anyway. Bravo does not give <laughs> um, a flying fuck about Warmongers recital. Could not care less. Right. Or so Star like, Starvo's just like, sure. That, that's why I've been... Uh, thinking it through i also think it'd be kind of interesting to see if a stubby's crouching tiger katsu, katsu. could be like fine-tuned into a combo rific deck right. there's there's a lot of firepower there right like if you if you could just figure out how you can set up the combo quickly enough like you can put out 30 40 damage easy. very easy yeah, and this is this has got my juices flowing quite a bit, and almost has me buying a ticket to Barcelona, <laughs> because the first ever Living Legend format event will be at Worlds in Barcelona, and I I love degenerate eternal formats in games. I loved playing Legacy and Magic, and I have and well, I loved all eternal formats: Vintage Legacy, Vintage Cube. Anything that let me do and play powerful degenerate things, uh, I always thought was a good time. And this is that. Uh, and it's whoever can figure out the most absurd thing to do and execute that game plan is probably going to be the winner. But there's also because of how much agency in most cases exists in Flesh and Blood, you still have to play the game. It's not just a sit down and winch type of shit. Like, you still have to do it the right way. Like, people a lot of times will play Starvo and like, oh, I missed on my fuse. It's like, well, did you pitch stack your fuses so that when they when you came around to second cycle that you were, you know, guaranteed your Earth Ice Lightning in every hand? No. Well, that's on you. What's second cycle? Uh, okay, that's the type of Starvo player you are. Got it. Um, But it's stuff like that, right? The... Uh, that that type of stuff is just fun as shit to me. I, I just I love it. It's so much fun. So yeah, I'm considering. I saw that flights were actually not that bad. No, they're not that bad. It's five seventy. It's like five seventy, five seventy five to for round trip from Des Moines right now. And it's back on the table. I mean, it's very long shot, very low odds, but it's back on the table. So there well, is that. I mean, people you know will be there. It's true. A lot of people I know will be there. It's not that's not the problem. Um, problem is no. That sounds like the solution. That is the solution. That's a big solution, honestly. Uh, so there. I mean, like I said, it's it's a long shot, but it's a consideration back on the table again. It's not like uh, my goal. My goal for September is to sleep in my own bed every night. I went back and thought that through, and the last month I did that in was, like, January of 2022, where I went an entire month where every night I was I slept in my own bed. So, yeah. Let's see if I can pull it off. So far, two for two looks like three for three is going to be on the, on the table tonight. It's going to be, we're going to, we're going to give it, give it our best. Um, but I know that like the first weekend of October, I'm going to be somewhere. Second weekend of October, I'm going to be somewhere. Third weekend, I think is potentially free, but the fourth weekend, I'm going to be somewhere. And the fifth weekend, yeah, it's it's just it's a goddamn nightmare. But it's fun. I keep telling myself that that it's fun. Uh, any other thoughts on Living Legend format? 
you usually have a lot of thoughts. You're kind of quiet about this one. I mean, I'm just very excited for it. All, all of my thoughts are more so like testing oriented because I am very enticed by this format and I'm trying to not let the announcement and the existence of it derail me pre pro quest <laughs> season. Like See, honestly, that that's too. Yeah, that is honestly it, right? Is like, I really have a lot of fun ideas that I want to throw at the wall and see what sticks for this, but I don't want to let that derail me from the immediate task at hand. And so I I am quiet mostly to restrain myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, you, if you're not focused, you know somebody that may shoot your dick off, just saying. Yes. Um, I was is... promised that my dick would get shot off last. And so I thought that that was very kind, personally. It's a lot of trust. That's a big trust right there to to trust me to have a dick the longest. Not the longest. You know what I'm saying. I, I uh, do know what you're saying, yeah. Um, moving on. Uh, your weekly reminder that the... Realm 20K Invitational Weekend is December 1st through 3rd in Columbus. I did check with the uh, proprietors of the Realm, the Bartrams, in, to double-check if there are still going to be qualifier events that are being run um, in September, October, and maybe even into November. And they said, yes, they extended that deadline out a little bit. So please uh, talk to your local game stores if you are interested and see if they are interested in running one of the event qualifiers. Uh, the information for running them is on realmgamingnetwork.com. Or um, you can post in our Discord. Both of the of the Bartram brothers are in there, and they we can get you pointed in the right direction for any sort of inquiries on running one of the RTI events uh, to get yourself an, inv an invite to the 20K Invitational. It's a again first through third in Columbus, Ohio, December first through third in Columbus, Ohio. It is a twenty thousand dollar cash multi format Invitational that starts on Friday. And then there is a 10K brawl on Saturday and a 5K team sealed on Sunday. The Friday, um, or sorry, the, the Saturday and Sunday events also qualify for the 50K 2024 Invitational. So B, uh, again, I've, I know I've said this a bunch, there'll be a cosplay contest. There's going to be some shenanigans. Uh, this is probably, you know, outside of the giant events of Pro Tour Worlds. Uh, this is probably the event that I would be that I would focus my energy on on the Flesh and Blood calendar. It's going to be one of the, if not the most fun weekend um, of the year. So I highly encourage attending. Uh, I do believe I mean I will be there. Charm will be there. Um, we'll make sure that Flake is there one way or another. I guess um, even if we have to go get him. But yeah, this will be a hell of a good time. So please, uh, if you're if you're on the fence about it, just take that as my show up, you know, recommendation. You don't ever talk about that. You have, do you have any thoughts on the twenty k invitational weekend? I I mean I don't have to have thoughts. Um, I'm not required to. That's the beauty. I'm going to be there, and I don't have to do any sort of uh, preparation as far as my lineup or anything because I'm going to be casting the event. And so, uh, outside of staying current on you know, what's happening in flesh and blood. I don't have to have thoughts. So that's like the best way to prepare for an event as far as I'm concerned, which is know I'm going to have a good time, know that I'm showing up um, and that's it. So I'm kind of envious of that. Yeah. You know, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. Huh. Hmm. I would. Yeah. Awkward. What do you think about some listener questions? That sound like fun? We got, yeah, a, that sounds, we got a fucking doozy in here that's going to... That sounds outstanding. That's going to eat some time, so we're going to go with a little bit of an aperitif to begin because, uh, well, you know, because it's a question about food. Uh, this is from uh, Dracohominus87. I, I don't know what that means. But uh, the, the question is, what kind of dish do you think is most popular in each region of Wrath? Which hero do you think would have the most talent in the kitchen? Region specific dishes? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would think that Arya is very farm to table. Um, Savage Lands would be very meat centric. Uh, Mysteria fish 
it seems like a fishing village type area. Um, Solana, a bunch of boozy, bougie bitches uh, eating escargot and drinking chablis. And but yeah, look, what's the look? I, I was just going to say that metrics is Soylent Green. Oh, yeah. Soylent Green, absolutely metrics. Yeah, it's people. Um, then the Soylent Green is made of the people in the pits who are eating gruel or whatever because it's the pits. Well, it'd be like a depression stew or a Hoover stew is what they called it back in the depression where people would just yeet shit into a stew pot every day and anybody that contrib contributed to the stew pot got a bowl of it. And, right. And stone yeah, soup. Stone soup, basically. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's the pits. Uh, I would imagine some, a very like almost Thai like, palette in Volcor, just super yeah, it's gotta be hot. something something spicy yeah yeah that, that would be my thought um though they could pull like in iceland and actually have outstanding bread it's bread so like, it's always outstanding right but specifically like because of the geothermal energy and the way they prepare it um you can prepare bread by like burying it depending yeah. on where you live there right and it just always turns out perfect um being the you know volcanic area of race i would expect volcor to be able to uh, pull that off and you say like oh it's bread it's always good but like the bread in volcor is going to be way better than the bread in metrics or the pits or yeah you you're know, probably like, right like your good bread spots are probably uh volcor solana and uh, I'm going to say Aria, but not Mysteria, actually. I think Mysteria is... No, Mysteria is more like a sushi type of thing where less bread-centric, more rice-centric. I... Well, but also just in terms of like how you would do those things, I think it's more wrap, right? Like yeah, yeah, you're, you're, sure. you're wrapping stuff up. Yeah, I think that that's fair. Uh, who do you think would have the most talent in the kitchen? Uh, that's an interesting one. I have strong feelings about this shocking um <laughs> i'm gonna you know, my my instinct says briar i think that she would be very farm to table in that kind of contemporary cuisine style she'd kind of know what she was doing with it um granted you're gonna it's gonna be sort of vegan centric which is fine i've, I've had some very good vegan food but i i feel like that's gonna be your ticket is gonna be briar uh, okay, Derek, you have strong opinions, so go for it. It's Genus. He's got money. He's well traveled. Look at him. He likes to eat. But you he cannot he tell me. He pays people to make no. his food. No, because he's a he's a traveling merchant though, and so he doesn't have people with him when he, like he's a guy who when you're out on the road and you sit by the campfire, Genus is gonna make you the best like campfire food you've ever had. And then when you give him resources, you give him a kitchen. Oh man. All right. I'm eating any meal Genus prepares. That's all I'm saying. That's fair. You know I mean, why? Do you want to know why? Because he's got, he's what, got you need. what you need. Because he's got what you need. Okay. Okay. Well, that was a nice little cleanser. Now let's get into the fuckery of it all. <laughs> um, this question is from Dom. Uh, it is dealing with negative play experiences such as poor sportsmanship, bad beats, or just that one person. Share a moment slash story you've encountered and how you look to prevent or deal with it when it happens. <sighs> okay. Uh, Derek, you went on, you went first on this one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Of course great. I want to go first. Cause let me, let me, good. let me get this off my chest. All right. I'm that person. <laughs> all right. Uh, I, uh, I am your negative play experience. I am. Do you want to know why I'm your negative play experience? Here, here's why it's multifaceted mind you first let's say we're having a good time together which is usually my goal um when i win i'm probably going to apologize say that you outplayed me anyway and then you're going to feel really bad because you're going to be like yeah that guy's right i got so unlucky so like i am contributing to every bad beat story ever because i never win out of my own skill it's always because i got lucky and it's psychic damage long term but also just because you know i've spent a lot of time one uh creating content live streaming things like that and two not taking myself very seriously 
Um, even when I'm playing at somewhat serious events, I have a, a tendency to uh, be very vocal and jovial, and uh, that will manifest sometimes in some very negative ways. Uh, for example, and I and I apologized on the day of, uh, and I will apologize once again, um, but I once uh, was playing against uh, Ethan, Mr. Mansant, and um, I believe it was at a ProQuest. It was, it was at least one of the like higher tiered events, right? Um, and so we're, we're playing and uh, he was on Levia. I think I was on Chain at that event. Um, we're going back and forth. It's kind of close. And he goes to do something. And I, I say to him, just like, I don't even think you have enough stuff to whiff, do you? Because he's counting it out. And he goes, no, I have exactly three. Because, of course, he knows Levi in and out, right? Like, it's just what he does. Um, so there were a bunch of cards there. But exactly three whiffs. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, you know, sure. I guess roll it, right? So we roll the die for the random selection. And he, and he hits the, the three for the whiff and takes a bunch. But when the third die hit, because you have to remember, like I don't take myself seriously. I'm very rarely lucky. Um, and I'm also just like in my, you know, good time. Uh, that third die hit and I laughed. And it wasn't even like a ha ha. It was like a ha ha <laughs> Deep guttural laugh. Um, and he says to me, uh, he doesn't make eye contact. He, he's kind of looking down and he goes, you know, um, I understand, but you laughing's like not really good for the mental. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. It just kind of came out of me um, because like, that's just it, right? Like I am not taking it seriously. So I, I am that person uh, that is probably going to cause you to have a negative play experience. And if I wasn't before, uh, this is the other reason why I was excited to talk about this topic. Uh, I think I'm going to be next year. I've been thinking about that interview that Flake and James White had about oh, not heels. enough, not enough good heels, not a, not enough trash talk. And I feel like I can still be delightfully friendly when I'm not competing. But I think 2024 is going to be the year of the heel turn. I have to, I have to craft my persona. I have to figure out exactly what kind, what brand of trash talk I want to levy. Um, and then I'm going to stick with it because if there's one thing we know about me, it's that I commit to the bit. Commit. So I have not, I have not landed on exactly what it's going to be, but this is your forewarning in 2024. You're straight up not going to have a good time when you're playing against me. Fair enough. Outside of that, probably going to be wonderful. Yeah. But a delight. Uh, to answer your question, though, about how to navigate negative play experiences, um, all you really can do is, one, when you sit down at any game, um, I think that you have to go into it with the intent to have fun, right? Like, you're sitting down because you want to win the game, but I think what happens is sometimes we get so caught up in the desire to win that we also forget that one of the objectives is and should be to also have fun. And that one is oftentimes um, correlating with the other, but should not be dependent upon the other. And that takes conscious effort. Um, I'm, I'm very hyper competitive uh, and it took a lot for me to foster and cultivate that mindset. I had to sit down with purpose and say, my goal is also to have fun. And that also, I'll, I'll be honest, that's one of the reasons why I'm also uh, usually very like talkative and, and jovial and I will crack jokes on both sides. And that's probably why I laughed with Ethan because in many ways, that's also like my way trying to find a way to have fun because when I lose, I don't want that to, to sour my play experience. Um, and I also, I, I don't want my sour experience to take away from my opponent. I feel like uh, my opponent, if they do beat me, deserves to feel good about that. And the last thing I want to do is ruin that moment by being an asshole either, right? So I think that part of it is you have to sit down with purpose to have fun. And then even when they are not holding up their end of the social contract, you just have to hold up yours and rinse and repeat. All you can do is kind of like control yourself, control 
your purpose, your objective, your mindset. Um, it's much easier said than done. And like all things, it requires practice. It is a skill you have to develop. I still struggle with it at times. I will fully admit, I hate losing more than I like winning. Full stop. Just very competitive have always been. And so I, many years ago, I had to like say for my own, <laughs> Uh, not just mental health, but like for my own ability to enjoy the things I'm supposed to be enjoying, I need to make sure that I'm enjoying them when I'm not winning because then you're just one losing streak away from giving up something that you love, hypothetically, right? So um, that that would be my advice. You have to sit down with the intent, with the purpose of having fun. You know, ask your opponent their name, um, you know, ask them some other questions, create a moment and try to cultivate that moment outside of the outcome of the game. Um, you still obviously want to focus on the game. You, you still want to try to win, but you have to try to separate the two and have one not impact the other. And not every player is going to reciprocate. Um, but again, all you can do is control you in those situations. Um, if they are a complete asshole or whatever, then you also just have to remember that it's just one round. It'll be over. Um, and you can do your best to, you know, insulate yourself in the future. And it's not even just players. There's also judges. Um, thankfully, flesh and blood judges are mostly outstanding. There large. is there is one, however. Um, I will not say names, but in my uh, first calling in Dallas, uh, they were the result of an incredibly negative play experience for me. And so I just avoid them at all costs. And if they are the closest judge, um, I will sometimes just call for other judges. Uh, they probably don't even know I have a problem with them because I just avoid them. Um, and that that's that. So, yeah, that that's my advice, though, is it it really is just something you have to cultivate and you have to to go in with the intention to do it. It will not happen like on its own. Yeah, I mean, that's very, very true. Um, I, it When you're so that's there's also kind of a problem when you're kind of a gregarious talker. Like I'm, I, we're both talkers. We have a, we have two fucking podcasts together. You have a third one with Flake. So obviously we are, and you cast card games, you know, whenever you can. So obviously talking is in your repertoire. It's a thing you do. Great. So, but being a talker and being somebody who does that feels like sometimes it gives other people license to kind of treat you differently in games where they feel like they can say say something that bothers that you know that then ends up bothering you and it wouldn't be cool if they said it to somebody else i and you know those experiences can get to you that's very non-specific but i've had it happen a couple of times like eh, pump the brakes okay uh, we're actually you know playing a game here so try to you know try to keep it within the game if you can but i have no problem talking before and after or even during a lot of the time but it's like this is first everything else is second until the end of it. And then obviously everything's on the table, but um, flesh and blood has been very good to me as far as experiences go. I don't have many negative experiences. Um, I have one negative play experience that happened at a pro quest where I had just got an IP three or whatever it was uh, playing Starvo into Oldham, hmm. which I'm already in trouble. Like that's very, very bad. And then I was, we had rolled, we had rolled dice and I had already chosen to be on the play before they came over to tell me about my IP. And then I'm like, okay, well, can I change my choice now since I didn't have the information about the IP and I should have, and they're like, oh no, you have to stick with your choice. I'm like, fantastic. I, uh, and I worked my ass off in that game. I, created a pitch deck that was going to give me if i was able to live was going to give me three turns of oak and old oak and old oak and old to end the goddamn game and i knew that was my only way of winning was to make sure that this is stacked exactly how it has to be and we are through and i had to go through three pitch stacks to do it um but we're set up i'm set up for end game now feel good about it and so i start hitting them and my opponent it starts doing the whole, oh, so fucking lucky, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, don't react. Don't react. And then I they hit the second one. It's like, oh, of course you have two. I mean, obviously, just the luck's everywhere here. And I'm like, 
okay. I don't want to be a dick about this, but these are the three, the next four cards on top of my deck. And I will show them to you when I oak and old you again. And then I did it. And it killed him. Mm -hmm. It's on three fucking fused oak and olds in a row. What are you going to do? And he was just like, calls a judge. And he's like, my opponent marked his cards. And I'm like, they deck checked us, which is why I had an IP penalty. Cause I wrote a wrong card down. They, you know, my cards aren't marked. And I'm like, and so I just took it. I'm like, yeah, go ahead. Take a look. He's like, no, we deck checked you before the round. I'm like, right. And he's like, well, he then he shuffle, shuffle cheated or something. I, I haven't shuffled. I, I literally pitch stacked these cards because it was the only way I could win. And it worked. I got, I lived long enough to win. And he's like, that's, that's bullshit. Picks up his cards, just walks away. And I'm like, okay, I guess. And then this was a marathon round with a deck check, IP penalty, the round. And then the judges turn the round over immediately. And I'm like, can I get two minutes of extension so I can just walk, drink water, use the bathroom? I'm like, nope, nope, you'd be tardy. I'm like, okay. And so did not played like shit that game which was a win and in for top eight and so that kind of derailed me and i was like god this sucks like that that experience was horrible but it's the only bad play experience i've had in the game we did have one and they don't play anymore uh pretty toxic person in our local community uh Toxic in the ways that was very creepy to any female players that would start playing. Um, kind of just always very like obnoxious, a lot of proselytizing, a lot of, um, you know, very anti um, people's rights. Uh, it was, you know, very difficult to work with and be around and talk to. Um, and I, I tried human moments, right? I, I, I try to engage with people the best I can. And so I'm like, okay, maybe if I just increase the gravity of the moment, he'll respond in a way that like it will click. And so it's actually telling, me a, telling him a deeply personal story that affected me a lot to kind of give him some background on why, on why I am the way I am, because we're very different. And he, in the middle of it, just, you know, and this is some, you know, stuff that means a lot to me. He just, in the middle of it, launches into something else entirely because of, of a word usage or something. And I just lost my shit. I just, you know, I basically, and this was on me as much as anything, but, you know, basically told him, look, you fucking piece of shit. I am sitting, <laughs> again, I, I'm telling you, it was on me too. I'm sitting here trying to engage with you as a human goddamn being. And all you're worried about is over this fucking thing. Like, this is why people don't like you. This is why people don't want to be around you. This is why when you were traveling to events and there's a carload of people are, that are going and you're in that car, I'll just drive myself because I would rather pay that gas bill on my own than have to spend that time with you. So fuck right off. And I'm like, I'm trying to tell you a personal story so we can have some sort of like common ground and you just shit all over it. Get the fuck out of my sight. And they're like, oh, I'm sorry, I, uh, you know, yada, yada, go on with your story. I'm like, no, go fuck off. I tried, and you never have. So I'm done here. Get the fuck away from me. If we're ever paired, I'll just concede and walk away. I don't want to have to deal with you. And that was that. I, I'm too old for that shit, right? Like, I do not have to deal with people that I don't like if I don't want to. And... Yeah, I, I remember I remember that like it was yesterday and now you do a podcast with me. <laughs> Not exactly. But uh the first <laughs> the first interaction with you was uh it was down in the original speakeasy and man I thought you hated me. But then I turned out that no, that's just how you talk to people. Just like yeah. e Eeyore with a e Eeyore with a neuroses. So um When I was younger, I used to have a lot of people tell me that I intimidated them for some reason. And I think it's just because I, it's so weird. You know, you mentioned that like I'm a talker, but I think in my personal life, I tend to not be, uh, again, much like 
my play experience as the talking thing is something that I've had to cultivate. It's very against my natural reaction. Um, but yeah, when I was younger, I used to have a lot of people say that they felt like I was um, like either stuck up or just an asshole or conceited or whatever because they weren't getting the right social cues from me and it's really just because i'm sad right <laughs> like that's that's it it's not it's not you it's me so yeah right so kind of going into the back end of that question how you look to prevent it um typically it's by being upfront. um it's by, you know, taking a moment saying, hey, I get you're, you know, you're in a bad headspace or you're whatever, but, you know, I'm just trying to enjoy the game with you. So what can I do to help? Um, especially in like those arm race situations and whatever. Um, and it's, I try to approach those more casually unless I'm playing somebody who is competitive, like who is naturally competitive. I'm going to be sitting there going, oh, no, 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 you did not want to do that in this order. You know, this, 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 you know, maybe this will be better. Um, you know, obviously don't have to do it that way. You can do it your way, but this is just an insight in how to play the game, you know, how to, how the different the game works. I'm, you know, if you, and I always ask, you know, you want some advice really quick and it's like, you're my opponent. Well, yeah, but I don't care if I win. So, you know, do you mind if we talk this through, um, preventing, so preventing people's feelings is basically impossible. Um, people are going to feel the way they're going to feel. That's some people have this high value on winning. And when they don't win, they sink. Um, and, you know, everybody likes to win. Nobody likes to lose. I mean, in reality, you don't play games to lose. Um, you play them first and foremost to enjoy yourself, but usually the objective is to win, right? Like, that's what you're playing right. for. And so losing is never a great experience for people. Um, but you can make you can make the game itself enjoyable enough so it doesn't hurt as much. It doesn't sting as much. And when you see in like in a competitive atmosphere, it's really hard to do that. Somebody sits down, they're slamming their shit around and they're just in a bad mood. You know, my take on that is okay. Um, we're at a competitive event, something has happened. Um, if I see them in an obviously super distraught mood, I'm going to just call a judge and kind of go away from the table like, hey, this person's exhibiting some behavior that I, this is not cool. Like it's something is really wrong and I think it needs address. Can you come watch and kind of make sure that I'm not off base? Uh, if it's in a, like, a, like again, a, a casual environment when you're with your locals and something, it's like, Hey, what's going on? You know, is there anything I can do to help? Um, what, what can I do to help this experience or, or whatnot? Um, it, that's that's really the best you can do though there's just not a lot of avenues because games are um some people put a lot of identity into these things and when they do and they find that they're not achieving their expected result when the thing they thought was going to work doesn't when um it, it, just you can run down a laundry list of things that really you know has gives puts them in a negative headspace right away. It's hard to diffuse that. It really is. Um, some people are better than others, but no one should put that on you to do it. Um, that's if you have a concern, you you know your options are usually to to stay in the game and then hey, good game, walk away um, when it's over. Or like I said, in those instances where you feel like it's something that's really not great. Um, it's to try to address it or bring somebody over that can help. That's about it. It's, it's, I'm, we're very lucky in my mind in the flesh and blood space that we don't deal with this that much in the magic space. It was every event, like, it, like clockwork, every event. And I mean, I even had a judge rule against me because they literally, the reason they ruled against me in the magic event, and they said this to me, to my face, was like, because it's you, I'm going to rule the other way. And I'm like, what? Like, what? I don't, that made no sense. And I just dropped from the tournament. I said, nope, I'm good. And they're like, well, you're X1. I don't understand why you're dropping it. Cause like, I'm not going to be here with that head judge. That's it. Like, I'm never going to get a fair shake. They just basically told me that. So I'm walking away. Uh, so yeah, it's difficult and I get it. 
but it's kind of a do your best scenario. That's about it. Anything else, Derek? No. Fantastic. Moving on. Uh, we got our, our friend Rich, the Polish guy, uh, asking with a clear reprint policy between sets and history pack, getting closer, comma, getting closer to the Pokemon min max of cards, LL being a format, and a new product for the casual crowd with the prop. LSS has addressed concerns about players and their viability in the game. I would love to hear your thoughts your thoughts on from you. Nope. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, nope, that doesn't work either. I'd love to hear thoughts on from you both on the four products a year plus one extra side piece maybe plan. I love it and will keep me in the game longer than the alternative, but it's a thing I haven't heard from you two uh, in depth together. Okay, so I think he's asking about products and the little plus ones per year in the release schedule. Um... So quarterly releases, I think, are great. I think that that's a good flow. And having one uh, ancillary, casual, dual deck type product a year is is fantastic. Uh, I think that that's trying to keep things flowing competitively is probably the most difficult part of any TCG. Just is. It's really hard to keep printing cards and um, meaningful cards at that that enhance rather than just nuclear impact the game in meaningful ways uh, and taking your time and doing, you know, four a year feels about right uh, instead of the Watsy model of four a month or whatever it is. The, and then the one little, you know, the one other, you know, product, whatever it is. So like classic battles or the prof box or whatever uh, to kind of draw in new eyes and, and, create another intro point also very very important so i think that this product schedule is something they should keep up it really does pull a little bit from magic um although magic's releases were you well there was four a year there was a block usually you know three full sets in a year and then a core set and that always worked out and then they started introducing some other little things originally it was dual deck so they, they actually looked damn near identical to classic battles and those work too. So I think this is another kind of copy of of old school Watsy, which is a good thing, not a bad thing. That is a feature, not a bug. Uh, because basically they're lifting their OP, which was the best OP of Magic, and adopting it not completely across the board, but virtually and nearly across the board as Flesh and Blood's OP. And then... Uh, they're doing a lot of the same product release type things, and it was glorious. It worked great. It grew the game. It checked all the boxes. I think that that is kind of the plan they're going with, and um, yeah, I'm into it. Yeah, I just want to piggyback and say that I, unless they are small products where they're, you know, starter decks or whatever, I and more than happy with the four a year. I, I think that that is the right thing. I think once every three months is just a, a, a good cadence and it doesn't kind of create product fatigue, but doesn't feel like too long in between them. Um, I don't, I don't want to feel compelled to participate. And I know what, you know, some folks might be saying or what, you know, you, the listener might be thinking, which is, you know, they could print more products, but then you could just be more selective about them, right? And that is something that's been in my mind with the Bright Lights expansion coming. Um, you know, if you don't play Mechanologist, for example, then maybe you just set that one out. But the problem is, is like, I also like to play Limited, and so I'm going to dive into that set one way or the other. Uh, but also, this game is clearly a game where they understand the importance of collectors. And what I don't want is to feel left behind on the collector side of things because I'm not engaging with every last little product, right? That's one of the reasons that Wizards lost me with Magic. It came down to me just feeling like there's no way I could keep up with this if I wanted to uh, with their current pace and it's not going to slow down anytime soon. Um, 
and that's that's just not for me right like i i like feeling like it, you know if i want to i have the opportunity to engage with everything um, both in terms of time investment and financial investment and so i just really like the you know once every three months ish cadence yeah uh, it just like i said i think it works um that's my that's just the best way i have to put it is i just think it works um moving on our last question is from tiny 10 hands which we got explained what that meant and i i read it every now and again when i want to make sure that i'm not the craziest person that i know um but it turns out that somebody convinced them that it's a great username because they're like yeah you have small hands and you have 10 of them which no you don't you have two if you're tiny 10 fingers okay okay first of all we don't know that they have 10 fingers we don't we don't it is and second we don't know that they don't have 10 hands they copped to not having 10 hands so far <laughs> well we they could grow more uh but they ask do you think that any currently legal CC hero will be able to keep up in the LL format? And if so, who? Yes. Short answer is yes. <laughs> um, I actually think multiple ones. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at too. I believe that y right now, so if I were going to take a stab at it, I would say Fi with Stubby Hammers, uh, Belittle Minnowism Package Back, and Plunder Run is pretty damn good. I uh, I also think that, you know, like, I think there's going to be a good Skeleta Viscerai build. I just, I'm not smart enough. Um, there could even be, like, some crazy Ranger deck with, again, Ball Lightning Lexi or whatever that just goes burr. So, yes, I think because you get those banned cards back, you can do some really crazy things. I think Lexi, Phi, and Briar are all definitely worth at least looking at and testing. But I also can't help but remind folks that Icelander without a ban and restricted list is also suddenly very terrifying. Yeah. Because there are some things that she had that she then lost, and if she gets them back and then also still has Warmongers... Um, that is also very much something that I would be concerned about. Yeah, play Warmongers. Cool. I'm going to choose War. Great. Arsenal Pass. Hypothermia, you. Oh. Yep. Oh. Well, shit. Like, that's a pretty good way yeah. to do it. Yeah, she can straight up, like, take time walks while dealing you damage. <laughs> yeah, it's not okay at that point, honestly. Yeah, so there are absolutely heroes that are not living legend that can keep up because of, and, and I think that's actually smart for them to do this, but because of the no ban and restricted part, um, yeah, there's, there's absolutely, e even current heroes just getting, like, belittle minnowism, I, I think is also something that you're going to end up looking at right um a little minnowism is definitely the sort of thing like i wanted to be able to try out in uzuri even um but also when i think about some of the neat things you could do with like riptide uh with belittle minnowism uh to feed you your fuel but then because when you play both of those you get the free loads like there's i don't know i i think there's a lot I think there's a lot, but the the ones that immediately jumped out to me were uh, Lexi, Briar, Fi, and Icelander. Yeah, and then just the existence of the card Plunder Run. If you've never experienced Plunder Run in your life, just go read the damn thing. It's it's dumb. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, once you... Plunder Run was the reason that I started thinking about Riptide too. I will be honest, right? Because sure. Riptide is like you can start with the i'm gonna belittle and then i'm gonna use belittle to load the plunder run for free and then i can play plunder run from the arsenal 
to give you know my next attack plus three but also threaten drawing cards and then i'll you know pitch the minnowism i just went into fetch to load some arrows and then like... shoot, shoot this arrow plus three <laughs> yeah and, like they're yeah like, it's just not ugh. there's there's a lot of interesting stuff that i think riptide can do with plunder run and belittle and minnowism yeah but plunder run is just uh, I, again like I, ball lightning i'm not as scared of um even though i probably should be but i, I was thinking back to like what cheerios briar was the best deck and it was like is it was a more of a function of ball lightning and plunder run or was it more of a function of making five embodiments a turn and you, a one card block sevens like was it I, having I a, a, think a free it was pl- unmovable like- or... More than any, more than anything, I legitimately think it was plunder on a little minnowism. Like ball lightning helped because it was like free damage. Free but I damage. legitimately the combination of belittle and minnowism, both for fuel, but also because you could fetch the red ones too. And then plunder run because if you remember when they were running like the rainbow plunder runs with the spellbound mm-hmm. creepers so that you could sneak in something that doesn't even look like it's relevant at all and then all of a sudden you're like oh by the way draw you card. know draw a card it gets go again oh the next attack also gets a surprise plus three because i shot it from my arsenal and by the way like now you take 20 <laughs> like just <laughs> insane things i i do think plunder run a little minnowism all coming back is a big deal yeah it's a lot uh well i think it's about time to get out of here and that means we're gonna say thank you to our patrons uh associate producers on up we have andy kenny salty sea cat uh blaze storm chris josh lance good thrust matt two tokes papa mike alex philip rich taylor and trevor also want to say thank you to all of our patrons that joined us for the first ever faff after dark this past wednesday it was uh well we uh i'm glad it wasn't recorded uh it was myself and uh the dulcet tones of mr greg uh hosting the show and it was a great fucking time. I had a blast. Uh, and I think, you know, Greg absolutely did too. And it seemed like everybody was really engaged and having a good time. And uh, we got a lot of feedback of, hey, can you do this more than once a month? And I'm like, no, I would love to, but time resources as yeah. a wise man that I'm currently staring at once put it. I, I think I'm going to change the order though for the memoir i think it's going to be resources and time because Mm. i like rat better than tar Mm. 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 yeah you do like city rats i do like city rats you're not wrong yeah they make me happy (laughs) it's the weirdest fucking thing um but if you want to become a member of our patreon uh, become a patron of fap if you will you can always go to patreon.com slash flesh and pod. The link will be in the show notes. Uh, if you want to reach the podcast, you can always email us at flesh and pod at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter at flesh pod. Uh, you can also join our discord. That link will be in the show notes. Uh, we are super responsive and we host things like fap after dark in that discord, which Jesus fuck Greg. Um, I didn't know you got up to so much weird shit. Uh, Charmer, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitter at that charmer, and most other social media is also that charmer. Uh, I've got a few that I have snagged. Just charmer. Uh, both Twitch and YouTube are just charmer. If you're trying to find those locations, so like Twitch.tv/charmer, um, you can find me in the Discord. That's a, a great place to find me. Ping me, say hello, but. If you see me on the street, you can also wave. I guess. You can send me smoke signals, um, okay. Morse code. You can uh, listen. If you really want to get a hold of me, a great way to get a hold of me is actually to just send me money. Uh, so, like Cash <laughs> App, Venmo, I'm a uh, charmer, um, at charmer on PayPal, you even. Shill. Look, it's not hashtag no free ads if it's not advertising like any sales or anything i'm just saying like if you just want to send me money i'm not stopping you 
Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't know what to do with that. So I'm just gonna let that let that breathe. I guess. Um. Yeah. What else do we got? Um. Oh yeah, you can find me. Also, personal Twitter is at Logan Peterson. But I'm also the person behind all the Flesh and Pod socials. So if you reach out to Flesh and Pod, you're just going to get me anyway. So either way is totally fine. I, I do check all of the different things most days-ish. Uh, you can also find uh, Derek and I on the Clash Ground podcast talking about Alpha Clash, if that's something that you're also interested in. Or if you think you might be interested, you can kind of just listen to the show and find and see, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you'd be into it. Uh, something that is unique to Alpha Clash is that we actually have spoiler cards from them for their next set. And so that will, ours will go live on September 6th. So uh, make sure that you are paying attention as it were. Um, Man, I don't think I have anything else. It's been an hour and a half of this. I think that's yeah, enough. I don't, I don't. I don't have anything else. I think that's a good place to stop. Yeah, it feels great. All right, feels no. feels good. Feels good. Feels good. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for joining us, and we will talk at you next week. Bye. Bye.